Hello and welcome everyone who's joining us here today. Uh, my name's Angela Vipierre. I'm an ABC journalist. I'll be moderating today's discussion as we mark the official launch of the Centre for Research Excellence in Healthy Housing. Uh, so before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and the traditional owners of the many lands on which we're all gathered. I'd like to pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, this is not an audience that I suspect will need much convincing, but we are here today because housing is a key social determinant of health, and yet, here in Australia, health and housing do remain policy silos. Uh, that's why it's exciting to be here at the outset of an initiative that merges these two fields and dissolves the policy boundary that we sometimes imagine between them. It is, of course, all the more significant that this ambitious new research centre is funded by the National Medical Health and Research Council, the government agency primarily responsible for medical and public health research here in Australia. Um, so it is a very big moment, but it is also just beginning. So to discuss our barriers here in Australia to healthy housing, what we could do and what we should be doing differently, um, it'll be quite a discussion, quite a long one, uh, but we have the privilege of hearing from the Centre's five lead researchers in conversation today. Um, so I'll introduce them all one by one. Firstly, uh, Rebecca Bentley. Rebecca is not only the Centre's direct director, but also a Professor of Healthy Housing at the University of Melbourne. She is situated today on Wurundjeri lands. Welcome, Rebecca. Uh, we have Philippa Howden Chapman. She is a professor of public health at the University of Otago in New Zealand. She joins us from Wellington. David Jacobs is a professor and chief scientist at the US National Center for Healthy Housing, joining us all the way from Chicago. Uh, so quite a time difference there. Peter Fibbs is a professor of housing at the University of Sydney. He is currently situated on Moaninia land at Hobart quite a long way from home. And Emma Baker, Professor of Housing Research at the University of, Sy of Sydney. She is currently situated on Kagana land. Now, welcome to you all. Uh, so there are 20 researchers involved with the Healthy Housing CRE from all over the world, as I mentioned, all with diverse interdisciplinary expertise. So they are bringing subtly different things to this discussion, the five that we have here today. Um, but first we are going to hear from the Centre's Director, Rebecca Bentley, to formally introduce the Healthy Housing CRE. Great, thank you, Angela, um, and welcome everyone. It's just so exciting to finally be in the position where we're able to um, start a program of research that's really about generating um, evidence in Australia around healthy housing and starting to set an agenda for how we can actually start to work um, with policy and with health and with housing people in Australia to make some of this happen. So just to frame some of that, I just want to share a few slides with you before we go into our panel discussion to give you a little bit of context for what we're doing. Okay. So as Ange said, the centre is made up of um, 20 investigators um, ranging from um, you know, um, organisations nationally to internationally. We have a set of senior um, chief investigators located across Melbourne University, Adelaide, but also internationally. So we're bringing in researchers, um, leading researchers from New Zealand and the US into our um, program of research. We also have a really strong body of um, associated investigators who are really going to bring a lot of depth and um, breadth to the team and to the research and we'll, um, you'll be hearing much more from them as our research program unfolds. We also are really um, keen uh, for capacity building in our program. So we're gonna have an active um, network of um, PhD graduate researchers, honours students and master's students who are part of our program, um, really with the aim of generating the next um, cohort, the next generation of healthy housing researchers in Australia. But before we go um, into much more of that, I thought it was worth spending some time just thinking about why do we need a healthy housing agenda in Australia. And for me, a really good way of framing this and, and bringing it, I guess, into perspective is if we think about our current draft national preventative health strategy in Australia. So this is our 10 year plan for prevention in Australia currently um, under, under or open for consultation. So in that document, there's a lot of um, 
conversation about the social determinants of health. And um, part of this is housing. So housing is um, situated as an important social determinant of health. Um, and the document describes some of the ways in which housing is protective and some of the ways in which housing can be adverse. But I think it's worth having a little bit of a critical look at this. So first of all, <clears throat> um, we have home ownership here listed as a protective aspect of housing. And over here under adverse, we have um, social housing as a potentially adverse um, social determinant of, of housing um, framed in the context of the supply and the poor condition um, of social housing in Australia. But if we think about what we know in this space, we know that really some of the evidence around the better health of people who are in home ownership in Australia is about who is in home ownership in Australia. So it's the, the composition of the people that are in home ownership who tend to be wealthier, um, who tend to have had sort of more stable um, housing careers, for example, who, um, who for those reasons alone um, might um, have a healthier, healthier profile, but in fact, it's nothing to do with the tenure in and of itself. So I don't think we could actually say that the tenure in and of itself is protective, but what we see here is um, a reflection of who occupies that tenure. We also know um, from other settings and from a lot of research that social housing can be an incredibly protective way that housing can look after people's health. It can provide affordable housing, it can provide stable housing. So if we disentangle social housing from the condition of social housing that we might find in some parts of Australia, I think we'd probably argue that social housing should be moved over into the protective um, uh, framing as a social determinant of health and that we might think home ownership should maybe come off this list. If we go down to the, the other elements of here of the table, we can see that um, we've got structural integrity highlighted, quality infrastructure and also poor conditioning. So what do they mean here? I mean, I think what, what we're pointing out here is that the condition of housing needs to be good to create um, good health outcomes. And this is true. So what can we do to achieve this? So let's think about having minimum standards in rental properties. And we also have the benefit of in 2018, the World Health Organization having launched healthy housing guidelines, which actually give us a lot of insight into the ways that we could actually improve our housing to have better health outcomes. So things like um, considering the indoor temperature of housing, the quality of the air in housing, whether there's mold or damp, whether there's overcrowding, um, noise, whether there's toxic substances, we can actually think about all of these in terms of our housing condition and think through how we can create healthier housing. So part of this then is thinking about where is this concentration of unhealthy housing in Australia? And we know that it tends to be in lower income settings and that it tends to be concentrated um, in such a way that, for example, Indigenous housing is actually of fairly poor quality and that's been a fairly persistent issue in Australia that we, we need to deal with. So we've got our WHO Healthy Housing Guidelines. And if we were going to rethink our, our table in terms of the way we might pitch housing as a social determiner of health, maybe instead of um, thinking about structural integrity and quality of infrastructure, we could think about this in terms of implementation of the Healthy Housing Guidelines in line with what's happening in other settings across the world, and also think about things like minimal standards. So, you know, can we put codes of practice in place to ensure that we can have, for example, adequate indoor temperature in housing? And finally, um, there's the issue of security in housing, which comes up as well. So in this document, it's pitched as both um, a protective factor and an adverse factor. And security is really important, but I think we can be more specific about what we mean here in terms of how that generates health or poor health outcomes. So we know that secure tenancies in the private rental sector can be a really important way of providing people with not only stability of housing, but better health through the um, reduced stress that that creates, but also through other pathways being integrated into communities um, and having more control over things that are happening in their immediate environment. We know, for example, that crisis accommodation in Australia, um, you know, has, has been tested um, more recently in, in COVID times. Um, and we've been able to really come to the party with helping people in terms of um, people needing support for their, um, their housing. So people um, who are homeless, for example, being able to be housed in hotels during uh, the COVID crisis. Um, and we know that 
that that sort of short term accommodation um, assistance helps, but translating that further into medium and longer term um, options for people who are facing either precarious housing or homelessness. Um, we know that there's actually disadvantage in some sectors of our housing system. So for example, in the rental sector, people with disabilities might be disadvantaged in terms of trying to get um, affordable accommodation. And that's something that we can think about as well in terms of healthy housing. But I think also we need to acknowledge the complexity and changing need of people in terms of their housing. So sometimes what we think might be insecurity might be either the inability of people to move to better housing or it might reflect other aspects of people's lives. So this issue of security in housing is really quite an important thing to think through. And finally, in terms of this um, document that we, we have for consideration at the moment, in terms of our 10 years of prevention of um, poor health outcomes in Australia, we can look at um, where the evidence. So in this particular document, there's four um, citations of research. Um, we see that the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare document is referenced, which is excellent. This is an Australian source of data. Um, two of the other research pieces of research evidence that are cited, one's Canadian and one's from the US, um, which you know we've got really good quality Australian evidence on um, housing and on housing and health. So we should be citing our own evidence and generating our own evidence. And finally, we do have um, some really useful reports that have been um, conducted, um, particularly around um, housing for Indigenous groups. But maybe we need to think about these things in context as well and not sort of be generalising this out to social determinants of health, thinking about specific groups and their needs and using the evidence in, in an informed way. So I guess what I would say here is that there's housing research in Australia is of high quality and is internationally respected to the extent to which um, a recent um, document on um, insecurity and mental health in Wales cited seven Australian papers. So we do have a lot of good evidence there, which we need to sort of bring together to inform the way that we approach prevention and the social determinants of health. And finally, what I'd say is that a healthy housing agenda prevents us from missing opportunities for prevention. So I've just got a table here. This is just some estimates. If we think about um, within a year, um, people who, who see a GP for um, asthma or, we, uh, or are admitted for asthma in a hospital, and we think about um, the proportion of those who might be exposed to something like cold and damp in their housing, and we just take a guess of what the relative risk of an exacerbation of their symptoms might be because of that exposure, and I'm saying that we're making an informed guess here because this is something we need to generate evidence on in Australia, then we can um, start to um, understand the, the potential avoidable use of healthcare services that could be achieved by providing healthier housing. So if we were to eliminate cold and mould and damp, we would see a reduction just in one year, just from one symptom, just from one exposure. So we're thinking about the pathway from housing through to asthma, that's quite sizable. And if we think about that being added up over a 10 year period, and if we think about other, other pathways through to health that um, are specified in healthy housing guidelines, then potentially um, providing standards in our housing could actually um, prevent a lot of um, healthcare use in Australia. So what would a healthy housing agenda look like? Um, first of all, we could consider um, what we have already, which is the World Health Organization Healthy Housing Guidelines. Um, working out how we can embed that in our policy in Australia. We can think about our rental sector, um, where the minimum standards are appropriate and how we might approach that. We can think about um, providing better standard of Indigenous housing in Australia that is um, main, well maintained. We can think about um, an expanded and well maintained social housing sector and see that as a protective factor in Australia, um, as it is in many other countries. Um, we can think about better and medi better medium and long term support for people who are experiencing um, disruptions in their lives. Um, if we think about the recent bushfires, these kind of issues are actually quite important. How can we help people get back on their feet? And part of the solution is um, through having a housing system that's responsive. Um, we want our research to be based on Australian evidence. Um, we need to have high quality research. We need to think about the complexity of what we're trying to understand in terms of the housing and health relationship. We need longitudinal data sets and we need a good understanding of our housing system that's, that's relevant to our country. And finally, 
to make all this um, sensible, we need good data collection of surveillance and monitoring so that we know where our areas of need are, we know um, how we're tracking over time in terms of implement, implementing any policy changes that we make. So having um, good data infrastructure that's able to track um, where our healthy housing is and what's happening over time in the sector is really important. So our Centre for Research Excellence, just to um, finish and sum up, will aim to um, tackle this across three research streams. So looking at life course prevention and intervention, looking at estimating the health gains and the costs associated with um, poor quality housing in Australia, um, and trying to capture some of the complexity of that. So using visualisation and new methods to understand that. And we want to understand that, you know, for all Australians. Um, uh, at the same time, we want to build up um, research capacity in this space. So it's something that, you know, Australia can move forward um, and lead into the future. So with that, I'd like to now flip to our fabulous panel to have a discussion about some of these issues. Um, and I might hand back to Ange. Uh, yeah, okay, so we've just, that's a fantastic sketch of this issue um, broadly. And I suppose um, a lot of the complexity that you were talking about there, um, I suppose maybe, maybe I was hoping to go through one by one uh, to everyone in the panel and ask them, if they could choose to make one change to make housing healthier, what would it be? Maybe we'll start with you, Rebecca. Um, I think that the, the one change that I would like to see is um, really this focus on minimum standards in, in rental property. So a lot of, I think what we see coming through um, in terms of the evidence is people who um, are in properties where they might be exposed to mould, um, there might be kind of structural problems and it's unclear, you know, what they can do in the terms of, in terms of rectifying that, but also in a really competitive rental market where, where it's quite expensive and there's a lot of competition for rentals, people um, feel it's difficult to negotiate um, these kinds of things with their landlords. They might be concerned about a rental increase. So to diffuse some of that, if there was just a sort of a minimum expectation of what, a, you know, a dwelling would be, um, like that would, would help a lot. And I do know that some of the rental reform that's currently happening um, in Australia and it's unfolding at different phases in different states will give some attention to this. Um, and also I think some of the new social housing that's planned in Victoria will also give some attention to minimum standards. So it's a really good opportunity to actually test that and, um, and see what sort of benefits we get. I know as a renter, I would very much appreciate some minimum standards in that area. Um, Holly, uh, sorry, Emma, let's um, go to you just staying with Australia. What's, what's the one uh, change you would choose to make? Do you know, I think that, um, you know, the, the improving standards in the rental sector is an absolute no-brainer, you know, that there's poor quality there. But to some extent, I think by just focusing on the rental sector, we kind of miss a trick. So we should probably be aiming even higher and saying, what if we had minimum standards in Australia? Because if you just focus on one tenure, it really creates perversities in, in the way that, you know, different people miss out, different, you know, mum and dad landlords get out of providing rentals. So if you just create a minimum standard, at, you know, a bar which, you know, we say as Australians, this is what we do provide for you and let that trickle down through the rental system. That's my change. Mm. Peter, what about you? Uh, and um, I, I'd actually um, jump into maybe social housing. Um, one of my areas of interest is, is um, part of the housing called accessibility. So um, and enabling an older person, say, to, um, as they age, to stay in the one house. And at the moment, in a lot of social housing, um, especially in um, our main cities, we've got things like showers um, that actually are over bathtubs. Um, and as you get older, um, that's a pretty dangerous combination. Um, a lot of older people um, can um, do themselves a pretty serious injury in a bathroom like that. Now, um, in some states, um, you, 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 you're asked to move house, uh, and a lot of times suburbs, rather than the actual housing agency modifying your bathroom and making it safe for you to age in place. So I'd like to see social housing authorities pick up that challenge and, and um, improve the um, design of their own housing so people can age in place in, in the house that they've become accustomed to. Philippa, you're bringing us a perspective from New Zealand. You're also um, aware of the situation here in Australia. What, what would you say in answer to that question? 
maybe on mute, I suspect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, kia ora koutou. Thank you for that question. I think the thing that makes the most difference is joined up government thinking, which links housing, health, well-being, employment, um, and that's partnering with the construction sector communities and creating employment in terms of apprenticeships. Um, I think it's really important. We have the well-being budget now in New Zealand and that's made a huge difference because that's become the outcomes, not profit, but environmental, social um, and cultural outcomes. And I think that makes a huge difference if you can shift what we're trying to achieve and housing is one of the most powerful ways to do it. And David, um, I'm so interested to hear what you have to say here, just because of, you know the the enormity, the wealth disparity in in the US, the the challenges must be enormous, and yet it is part of the policy thinking in the US, and we'll talk more about that later. But from your perspective, what would you what what is the one thing you would most like to see change? Yeah, I uh, <clears throat> I suspect it's not really one thing. Uh, everyone wants that, I know, for simplicity, but I think in this time of COVID. The idea that housing acts as a vaccine uh, has gained more traction. Uh, after all, housing and health were joined at the hip a long time ago, mainly for public health reasons. And then we kind of lost that connection over the decades as we specialized. But now I think it's becoming clear that in a general sense, we need to understand how those two are linked together because these are in some ways the two biggest parts of at least our economy over here in the States that, um, that are at stress. Um, and so the fact that we can uh, think about ways to have a, a research center, <clears throat> that was really key here, uh, to translate the evidence, to make uh, uh, get clear what the interventions are that make sense. How do we improve houses so that they don't make us sick, but actually support our health? Uh, mm. Those are all key factors, I think. Um, so I, I don't think it's one thing, I think it's, it's bringing the population along, um, educating folks, um, making the evidence, doing the research, and then translating it so that policymakers can both understand it and act on it. Thank you for your answers, um, everyone. And I wanted to pick up on that last point you made, uh, David, which was about um, communicating the stakes and putting it on the public's radar. Um, because as we all know, that is one of the quickest ways to get it on the government's radar. Um, what's the what's the challenge there? I know that when I looked into when I was invited to um, help out with this event and started looking into it, I learned a lot, um, and it's my job to look into issues like this. I mean, how do we go about um, kind of communicating the stakes to people and getting that message out? And and how do you think we're doing it that in Australia at the moment? Maybe I'll ask Rebecca to answer first. Thanks, Ange. Yeah, look, this is a really interesting one. And I think if we throw back to my um, introductory slide package and we think about what evidence was being cited in the table around housing as a social determinant of health, it's really interesting because at the same time as I'm sort of pointing out that some of that evidence is coming from other settings, there is a lot of really good quality evidence that is being generated in Australia through organisations like OHURI, the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute, um, the Healthy Housing Hub at the University of Sydney and, um, you know, us, uh, a group of, of healthy housing researchers who have now formed our CRE in healthy housing. Um, so it's intriguing sometimes that this evidence isn't necessarily filtering through. To some extent, maybe that's about the way that the evidence is conveyed and that's something certainly we'll be looking at in our, um, in our project. But also maybe it's, it's about I guess people understanding um, the potential and the value in, in looking at this and then taking that next step to look at what evidence is, is out there. So actually conceptually going, all right, we can actually prevent a lot of people, you know, going to their GP or being um, admitted to hospital if, you know, we eliminate um, cold housing or mould from housing. Um, so it's actually maybe creating a bit of a shift as well. Um, yeah. yeah, the success in doing that is an interesting question though, yeah. I think, you know, as David was saying, um, in the US, COVID, you know, to a far lesser, on a far smaller scale, but, but still a very serious one here in Australia, particularly in Melbourne, um, the outbreak in social housing in, in, um, in Melbourne was 
you know, the beginning of a, a very difficult few months for that state. Um, is, is that, do you think that sort of is a way that people can begin to understand perhaps the relationship between, um, as David was saying, the quality of housing um, and, and very real tangible health outcomes? I could probably answer that, Ange. You, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, COVID has kind of created this uh, this step change in public awareness, I think, in, in, in healthy housing. And I think, you know, we've all changed the way that we look at our own housing and a little bit about how we look at other people's housing, I think, as a public. But I think we haven't, you know, we all want backyards. We all want to live in the country. You know, we all want a space where we can work and things like that. Um, you know, it's changed all of that, but I think we haven't, we haven't kind of moved on from individual awareness to kind of public awareness. So people are only just beginning to speak about healthy housing, um, you, you know, in public, um, and only a little bit. Um, and it really hasn't made the jump to government, I don't think. Um, yeah, I mean... Maybe we could talk a little bit perhaps about um, the fact that these are very separate policy areas here in Australia. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I feel for, and David, I'll come to you in a moment because there's been some more progress um, in your respective countries on this front. But um, first, perhaps one of uh, our Australian experts could tell us about, um, I guess the history, you know, whether or not we've ever had a healthy housing agenda here in Australia. Um, pr pr probably I, if I could jump in on that one, Ange. Um, mm. not, not, not explicitly. I, I think one of the problems is people just assume that because a lot of our housing is not that old, it must be healthy. Um, you know, but, um, and, and I think the other issue is that um, a lot of the people that decide about what programs to have probably live, live in um, quite healthy housing themselves. So um, in a lot of areas, it's a, it's a problem of poverty. Um, you know, you know th those people get to choose the worst possible housing. So I think one of the jobs of the, um, the Centre for Excellence is, is trying to um, promote um, the, the degree of risk and, and the health gains that can come from improving housing across the community. I think um, people have just got a bit of a blind spot about it and they think it's a problem in, in, in other places, um, you know, slums in, in uh, other countries. Whereas, um, you know, having spent a fair bit of time looking, um, you know, poking into various houses, I mean, some of the housing on the outskirts of um, Sydney um, probably wouldn't look uh, unlike um, a, a lot of slums in other countries where you've got, um, you know, 10 people living in essentially a shed um, that, that um, is an illegal, you know, dwelling on the, on the edge of a, of a block in Western Sydney. So I think, I think that there's a real public awareness um, raising and I think COVID started that process, but hopefully um, sort of the, the um, centre will be involved not only in research, but in trying to get that information in, in really simple packages. How helpful do we think it would be if those portfolios were not necessarily, well, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll leave you to answer, but either merged or had some sort of formal collaborative relationship, both at a state and federal level? Is it, is it top down uh, would, would that kind of top-down change be a useful mechanism in your view? Yeah, that, that would help. I mean, it's like, um, it's been ironic in, in New South Wales, for instance, that um, the Department of Health is actually running a housing program into Aboriginal communities um, because they've discovered if they fix their housing, they save um, their health budget, you know, more than the cost of their housing programs. And I think um, the Australian bureaucracies are incredibly siloed and people just figure it's some sort of um, someone else's problem. And going back to Philippa's point about a national sort of well-being approach, if we actually looked at, at well-being rather than just looking at what's happening in individual government departments or agencies um, and looked across those agencies for well-being gains, I think we'd probably get a different outcome. Well, let's then ask Philippa, definitely that's a, um, a, a wonderful segue. I don't even need to invent one. Um, it, we have uh, panel, panelists here who are from two places in the world where healthy housing has been integrated at least somewhat into policy. Um, so in New Zealand, Philippa, what is the situation there? Well, I'm, I'm excited for Rebecca and Emma and her colleagues because I think we've been funded for 20 years now or over 20 years. And I think it does make a, a, a difference to have a centre that can then link, as 
talk, worked with David Jacobs, David Ormondy, Peter Phipps for many years, learn from other countries, learn with other countries, and then modify them to the local context. So one of the things that we did very early on is we focused on providing solutions to the housing problems and identifying evidence for effective housing interventions. We worked closely with the media. The media were very interested in this because it became a new idea, a new meme. Um, places like the Energy Efficiency Conservation Authority building associations. We worked very closely with councils and ministries, tribal iwi, and Statistics New Zealand. We got increasingly got uh, items about mold and whether you're cold in your house and um, housing that lacks amenities into the census and that provides some updating of all these things. And we've also worked with electricity companies and the idea is that we want, we have created robust evidence for effectiveness and also equity. Of course, the Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand is a focus for us all that we need to be considering equity at every point. Um, and, and in terms of the flow and benefits, I think if sometimes I ask, um, you know, taxi drivers that I walk most places, uh, you know, what do they think about housing? And they all say, oh, housing should be warm, dry and safe and sometimes affordable. Adam. So I think that is a meme that is really spread right across the country. And, um, and I think we've, we, we learned from, you know, the states who had the housing and urban development, as David said, these things as in Britain and the states used to be um, twins and then got separated. Um, but the progressive Labour government, um, which is now, you know, in its second um, term or coming up to its second term, which I have to say we are enjoying has set up um, kāingōra homes and communities. So it's not just houses, but it's urban regeneration to be a world-class public housing agency. And it works in partnership um, with housing and project developments with a very strong emphasis on the local communities, get employment in terms of creating apprenticeships. And, and I'm privileged to be on the ministry, um, put me onto the board which of Kainora, uh, which is another link from research to policy, and I don't quite know what the equivalents would be in Australia. And last year we got two very large research grants which were supported by the government, um, linking, looking at what can um, have an impact on um, what impact research can have on policy. And then we've actually looked at six different housing providers and compared their governances, their financial structures, and what the impact is on the well-being of the tenants and communities. So we've done lots of things that can be picked up practically and are seen to make a, a difference to policymakers. We piloted a rental warrant fitness, and that led to a healthy homes guarantee for all rental um, properties. So that minimum standard that Rebecca was mentioning before. Yeah, minimum yep. standards. We had to have retrofitted insulation, have to have fixed heating, ventilation, etc. And our work has also led to a change in the Residential Tenancy Act. Um, so um, there has been quite a flow on, not just from us, but spearheaded, I think, by us on quite a number of occasions. And then there's the work that we maybe can come on afterwards that David Jacobs and Peter and I have been on, involved on the WHO guidelines. I think it'd be interesting to come back to that afterwards. Just, just quickly before I move on to David and talking about the US, I, I'm interested because it seems in terms of how this shift came about, because this is the same kind of shift that, um, that it, you know, we're trying to achieve here in Australia. Um, how much of it was like a government that just kind of got it and made it a priority and how much of it was that kind of slow, steady, you know, building the, you know, building the pyre uh, of, you know, evidence and, and bringing the media on board and that sort of slow, careful work? Um, well, the government has certainly got it, partly because it's a small society and, and, and we know a lot of the government, um, you know, as friends and otherwise. But, but also, I think it's because... We worked out very early on that if we were going to reduce inequalities, well, it was hard to do it in the money supply, but housing was an area which everyone either aspired to or, or, or lived in. So um, it was a very um, material, it was like the Internet of Things, it was the, uh, the idea of a house is a very pivotal one or an apartment or a dwelling. 
mm. um, to mobilize people. It's not that you're excluding some people and including others. So we did a lot of framing around how we did it early on. It's just about the most universal need. Um, yeah. So David, let's talk about the US now. Um, to what extent is uh, healthy housing and you know health and housing are those policy are those words that are kind of smooshed together in um, policy? Uh, how integrated is it? Well, it's uh, maybe a, just a brief history. Uh, it wasn't always that way. It used to be, for example, that uh, look, uh, housing and urban development and the Department of Health and Human Services they're not going to merge anytime soon, but they can collaborate. And what the problem we had here back in the 80s and 90s basically was we had doctors who were trying to figure out how they could remediate uh, housing hazards. Well, they're not really trained to do that. And then you had some housing people trying to interpret blood lead data or medical data, which they're not trained to do. But if they work together, then they could come up with a plan that made sense. For a long time, the housing people in my country basically said, you know what, this is a health problem. We're going to send it to the health department and let them deal with it. But the health people really don't understand how housing finance work, how housing systems work, uh, and what matters to people who live in these houses as well. So uh, it, from a physician's standpoint, it makes no sense to have a child come into the emergency room, treat them for asthma or lead poisoning or whatever, and then send them right back into the same home that landed them in the hospital in the first place. They get that, they know it doesn't make sense, but they don't have the capacity to figure out how to change that. So what happened in our country was uh, the public got angry. Uh, there were hearings in Congress. Uh, parents testified and said, you know, my child's been made sick by my home. I didn't need the health department to come out and teach me to feed him right. I needed help getting my house fixed. And Congress got that. And they basically said, we will not, no longer subsidize homes that poison children. We're just not gonna do that, bad policy. So they set up a new office at the very senior level within the office of the secretary at HUD. And it was staffed by health scientists. Um, I ran that office for a long time. And I will tell you that the science matters. That's why I'm so excited about this uh, Center of Research Excellence because at the end of the day, the facts really drive policy. And if you have a respected voice, um, it's it, it's been my experience that government does listen if uh, parents give voice to those facts. Uh, there's a saying that behind every statistic is a tear. And so teaching parents to tell their stories in a way that is valid and makes sense can drive policy forward. So uh, we still have a long ways to go. I think there's this undercurrent that, you know, New Zealand and the U.S. have figured it out. So I'm here to say we haven't. We're still working hard at it. Um, but we have achieved some notable success over the last 30 years. We've had a robust research agenda. We're still at it. Um, and so I, I, my belief is that science must drive policy. And if we can create that evidence base and the popular will, uh, we will succeed. I, I have a bit of a curveball question. I'm just going to throw this open to absolutely everyone. But it strikes me that construction is kind of the linchpin in all this. It's it's you know, wh whether it's retrofitting housing or um, you know, talking about how you build new housing and implementing those kinds of minimum standards that both Philippa and, and Rebecca were talking about, that is the industry that has to be kind of brought to the table. Um, they're quite a strong uh, lobbying force here in Australia. Um, and I'm not saying anything controversial when I say that. What, what do we know about uh, how cooperative, um, how on board the, that sector would likely be because on the one hand is potentially sort of a financial boon for them. On the other hand, uh, it's extra regulation, which no sector ever truly loves. Um, what's, what's that relationship like? How do you sort of anticipate that? Maybe, maybe I could start off on that. And, you know, may, maybe, uh, so the construction sector is of course, you know, interested in, well, they're, they're there as businesses effectively. They're not there. They're not there to build, happy, healthy homes, they're built there to build profitable homes. So, so I suppose, you know, they don't have skin in the game in terms of healthy housing unless we have some of these minimum standards. Um, and as one of, one of our New Zealand colleagues once, once said, you know, that the construction code is just a list of the worst housing that you're legally allowed to build. So 
so that you know the construction code is a really powerful tool that we could use um, but we don't yet use that um, to create healthy housing in Australia um, and so I think that's a that's a really nice entry point uh, to kind of involving the construction sector. I, I think Angela you've, you've raised a good issue there and um, you know I've spent a fair bit of time in my career um, uh, dueling with um, construction sector um, peaks and lobbyists um, and I think um, it, it, because they're dealing with a, an industry with a lot of risk, they see any change as more risk. Um, so I, I, I guess one of my visions for the centre is um, trying to reach out and, you know, David was talking about it as well, reach out to um, the consumer um, as a way of the consumer demanding um, some changes in housing to make it more healthy. And that goes back to Emma's point about profit. If, if, if a apartment developer finds out that people don't want to buy their stock because someone starts complaining about some features in it that aren't healthy, they'll quickly think about changing their, um, their practice. Um, if it's, um, you know, some academic saying um, they're doing the wrong thing, maybe they're less willing to uh, change their behaviours. Anything to add, I suppose, um, particularly David or, or Philippa, from your perspective, yeah. what it was like bringing the construction sector along to make the changes that we've described? Well, I, I think COVID is a, a factor in here, but it had started beforehand because it is a risky business. There's high rate of suicide in the construction industry. And, and basically, Kaingoranga, the homes and community, was set up to work to crowd in the construction industry. They've got relational contracts called Pirintahi, and the government takes risks. It takes the risk that was putting lots of um, small, medium bit businesses out of um, work. So they say, you work with us, you work to above the code, you work to Homestar 6 standards, and we will ensure that we work with you and help with training, and, and, and it's joint projects, and there's a great deal of pride and and interest in that way. So it's not just a public-private partnership, you know, with, a, with differential risk between both. It's the state that says we can have the medium to long term. It's the state that has patient capital. So um, I think things can be different, but it is that, that those are very political issues, those ones. <laughs> <laughs> it depends what government you have. That's right. Uh, David. Yeah, and I, yeah. Go ahead. No, yeah, I was going to throw to you. I, I think uh, so. It's like any other uh, thing. It's uh, there are early adopters. Uh, so I can I have to say uh, the construction industry, like Peter said, they're kind of initially resistant as a whole, but there are early adopters who recognize that they can make money building uh, uh, houses that have health features to them, and they can market them, and they can provide jobs. So. Uh, th there, the, there tend to be few at the beginning. Now there are many more of them. Um, they're credentialed. Uh, the same thing goes for a housing inspectorate. Uh, the two kind of go together. So there's a big uh, private sector uh, feature there. there. There are jobs to be had there. There's profits to be made. Uh, I, I will say the housing market doesn't fully work properly because a lot of these health uh, features are kind of hidden. They're not recognized, which is exactly why the research is so critical. Once it's known, the market can begin to monetize some of these benefits and fold it into the normal housing finance structures. But, um, but it, it, you know, so my, I guess my, uh, what, what we did here was we found a few uh, construction firms and, and others who were uh, willing to move forward and then they could speak to their brethren a lot better than scientists like me could do. So we turned them loose and they went at it. They set up their own associations. Uh, we have a, a Lead Environmental Hazards Association, which is mainly construction as well as uh, uh, inspectors uh, that are mostly private sector. Um, so, you know, I, I think we still have a ways to go, but yeah, go ahead, I'm done. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I was just thinking, I, I, thinking about New York where I was lucky enough to spend some time recently. I mean, one of the big um, switch changes here is the fact that 20% of carbon emissions in most countries come from the construction and building sector. Uh, and most countries are enacting um, laws and acts to say you want to be carbon neutral by 2050 and so forth. New York, York requires all its building to be follow green 
um, principles, green building principles and be carbon neutral. So that's an environmental well-being that, that people can't say, oh, yes or no, they're going to be required to do that. And, and New York is one of the leaders there. So I think there's a, there's a really interesting story to be told about it's good for the people, it's good for the community, and it's also good for the planet. Well, yeah, one final quick point, and that is that uh, we now have a bill before our Congress that is called Housing is Infrastructure. Uh, ordinarily, most people think housing is a private matter. It's not infrastructure, but it really is. So we're hopeful that we'll see significant investment because housing is really something that we all uh, do share as a social good. Anyway. Um, well, while we're on the topic generally of, I guess, um, persuading uh, the public and the government about the need for um, structural change on this front, um, I had a question for, for you, Re Rebecca, about, and I know this is um, something that the centre is going to be focusing on in terms of its research, but, um, you know, surely a persuasive argument would be, uh, you know, not only pointing to where improvements in housing are made, the, the health impacts and the health benefits, but how quickly that happens. What can you tell us about how long it takes for health benefits to accrue when healthy housing um, is provided to people? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, this is a, a really good point in that, that um, for some um, relationships between housing and health, there can be almost an immediate benefit. So if you, for example, were to eliminate mould from housing or reduce damp in housing, then you would see fairly quickly a reduction in sort of the way that that's triggering or exacerbating people's, you know, chronic health conditions, including asthma. Um, so you might see some immediate um, benefits of that. You would certainly see immediate benefits for people's well-being who are living in, you know, living in housing that might be very poor condition or, you know, unhealthy in other ways because it's insecure, for example. You know, immediately providing people with a secure environment. And I think we see this in response to things like bushfires and, and, and helping people with accommodation subsequently. You can see an immediate benefit to their well-being and their health from that kind of assistance. But you will also expect to see longer term benefits over time um, through some of the longer term relationships um, that we see in housing health. So children growing up in, in housing that's more healthy, you know, their um, profile, their health profile as they're growing up in relation to cardiovascular disease and, and sort of other, other health outcomes that have a longer um, run of association between sort of being exposed to unhealthy conditions and, and, and the outcome um, would play out over a longer period of time. Um, and actually, I know that Philip has done um, some work in New Zealand on this and, and seen fairly immediate benefits from some of the interventions and programs that they've put in place. So I might actually throw to, to you to comment on some of that evidence, Philip, it's quite compelling. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Yes, we did, we, we did community trials, randomised control trials, and which we took a population and then we explained this all to people that some people would get the intervention in the first year, some in the second year, and then we compared the results afterwards. Uh, and we found in terms of retrofitting insulation, in terms of providing effective non-polluting heaters, um, in terms of providing um, vouchers for heating their houses, in terms of reducing the hazards of um, um, falls, in the home. Um, in all those areas, we could show an impact after a year. We would start one winter, um, follow up the next winter. So it's very rapid. And we've just had a paper that's come out in the um, WHO bulletin showing actually what an impact this has to the economy and all the areas I was talking about before in terms of health, days off school reduced and all those kind of things. So yes, it can be, um, it can be very rapid. Um, I, I want to move on at some point because we are rapidly running down the clock, but I, I want to talk about the World Health Organization um, Healthy Housing Guidelines. And now I know this is a really big question um, because we're talking about a 172 page document here, but as uh, experts who were involved in, in crafting um, these guidelines, perhaps you could tell us about, uh, I suppose, um, what, what the guidelines entail, but also the significance of, um, of this document. Who wants to go? <laughs> well, well you I'll start off very, I, start, I was the chair of it, and that was based on our community trials because that's the very strong evidence that they need. But Peter Phillips, David Jacobs, and another, a number of our colleagues were on it too. It took nine years. This is a very robust process, and WHO has to make sure that nobody has conflicts of interest, 
um, you have independent people reviewing all the work. It has to have very strong evidence to be able to make recommendations. So in any case, by 2018, they were finally accepted. We had an opening in the Kampala in the Northern Hemisphere and in Wellington in New Zealand for the Southern Hemisphere. And the, the, there are already a number of WHO guidelines, things about mold and lead that David's work on and a number of other things, indoor air quality. But this was the first time they'd ever put together housing and health guidelines all together. And the strongest um, factors that they found is crowding. As we know from COVID, if you live in a crowded home, you're much more likely to get rheumatic fever, um, COVID, and a number of other things. So that's the number one health risk. The other ones are indoor cold and insulation. And um, that really improves people health. Interestingly, one which I think is an important area from Australia is heat. That's just as problematic, but there are no, there's no evidence of indoor and outdoor um, heat being done at the same time. So we couldn't really um, make that a very clear causal case, except by modelling that Lydia Moraska in, um, in Brisbane did. Um, so that's an area, I think, related to the bushfire that's actually really important. Home safety and injuries is one that there's very strong evidence that if you fix up those things that make children, in particular, and old people fall, you can save a lot of um, heartache there. And the area which I'll pass over to Peter, because Peter led this one on accessibility. So those were the one, two, three, four, five areas that we thought were these are guidelines, people don't have to put them into law, but there's a huge amount of evidence and experience behind them. But Peter, can I pass over to you? Yeah, I think, um, thanks Phil for that summary. Yeah, I, I looked at the accessibility issue, but I, I think the issue in terms of um, implementation is an interesting one um, in that there, there's a set of guidelines um, for the whole WHO community, but trying to work out how you might engage in, in you know, different societies and countries and indeed in Australia, even in different states, um, you know, requires sort of a bit of an implementation strategy. And I think that's one of the things that we, we, we're working through at the moment. Yeah. But the good thing is it provides an evidence base for a whole range of um, um, you know, providers, for instance, um, community housing providers, if they're, they're interested in providing healthy housing, um, that can be, a, the guidelines can be a really good template for them. Uh, I, I think that, that, that the work of, um, of, of implementing those guidelines is something that, um, you know, the Centre of Excellence will probably, um, will, will probably take up. But the good thing is the body of evidence is out there. Um, those guidelines are very rigorous and hopefully that's the evidence that David um, mentioned, you know, combining that science with um, good advocacy is a way to try and make um, housing healthier in Australia and elsewhere. I'm so interested to hear you say, I mean, obviously there's an implementation strategy of working and, and you would, you know, work through that with government, but that it's not necessary. Like, it, you know, you can kind of bypass the government if, if that process is slow or it's taking a lot of work. If you're an individual provider or, or, or you know, if you're in the sector, if you're in the housing sector, and that is something that is just now available to you as an authoritative guide. Sure. Yeah, I think that that's that's the real benefit, you know. So trying to engage consumers with it, you know, if they're they're thinking of making a housing choice, they should know um, what what's likely to be good or bad for their health. And and again, that document I think is quite good at that. It's it's um you know, portrayed in pretty simple language. People can really see what, what some key issues are when they're actually selecting their own housing. Yeah, I, I think the important point about who, if I can jump in a minute, who, who you engage with, when we had a different government, previous government, um, in fact, who weren't interested in this, we worked with the local councils and got a lot of leverage there. And that's how a lot of the reform and in Europe has done at a, at a city level where they compete, begin to compete with one another. So the, those different levels are really important and they all provide different kind of leverage. Um, I, I, I just want to, I, I guess, because we're at the point now where we should start to sort of wrap up um, and, you know, this is an opportunity. You're welcome to not lob grenades. You're welcome to lob grenades if you like. Um, where are the kind of intransigent parts of um, Australian government? Whose job is it to really pick up the baton on this and run with it and, and perhaps isn't? Um, we can talk about levels of government if you don't want to uh, be lobbing too many grenades, but I would be really interested to, um, to hear you guys talk about 
who you think needs to um, lift their game here? Well, I'll go out there and say something. Um, <laughs> I, I, look, I think, you know, it, it, needs, it needs kind of national leadership. So, you know, we, can, we need to do lots of things at the state government level, the local government industry research, but, but at the moment we don't have clear leadership. And I think that's, you know, that's the story that we get from, um, from the US and from New Zealand that, you know, following in, in from this leadership, you know, things can start to fall into place. And I think, you know, kind of reflecting on these two guidelines, they've come at the perfect time for us, really, because they're, they're kind of a weapon that we can use for action. We're saying, you know, this is actually something that people are talking about and doing things about in other places in the world. And here's, here's kind of a guide for, you know, how we can do it. And as Peter says, you know, all levels of government and industry and community groups can use guidelines like this to hold up and, and kind of look at where our housing sits against it. Um, yeah, I, okay. Yep. Just very quickly, one of the things we produced in the States was a, a report called the State of the Nation's Healthy Housing. And what we did, a lot of housing stuff is local. We ranked uh, the major urban areas uh, on how healthy their housing was. And uh, believe me, you don't want to be last on that list. That turned out to be Memphis, Tennessee. When they saw that report, they said, oh man, we got to deal with this. <laughs> so sometimes uh, shining a light is uh, very helpful. Does anyone have yeah, any? And I think that's what's, oh, I was just going to say that's what's most useful about the WHO guidelines in that they give us a real way to focus some of that and actually start to measure and work out in Australia, you know, where some of our um, housing problems are, what some of our biggest problems are, who is living in the housing that we consider to be unhealthy, why and what can we do about it. So you know, national leadership is needed. We need um, good evidence. And we also need a really clear understanding of, I guess, the scale of the problem that we're dealing with in Australia. Um, so another part of the research that, that we've done leading up to the CRE is to try and um, understand the condition of Australian housing by measuring it. And there used to be um, a housing condition survey conducted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics that ceased in 1999. And since that, we, we don't have a lot of evidence. So, you know, again, part of... Um, this agenda is, is understanding, you know, what's going on in Australia so that we can, you know, make this case for why we need it, for the, that there is an urgency. But the WHO guidelines give us a really nice way to frame that and, and think about what we should be measuring. I've heard everyone, um, particularly on the Australian side, well, actually just across the panel, talking today with quite a lot of hope um, in terms of, uh, you know, there seems to be this confluence of factors at the moment that makes movement on this issue more um, possible than it has been in the past. Um, obviously, the, the very existence and, you know, the launching of this centre is evidence of that in and of itself. Um, you know, what are, what are the, what is your kind of big ambition here with this centre? Um, you know, I, I feel like universal healthy housing is, um, I almost feel, it feels like a naive question, but is that something that is within reach within our lifetimes here in Australia? Look, I think it. I think it could be. Um, I'm really noting Philippa's comment about you know 20 years of working um, closely with stakeholders, governments, building up relationships. Um, you know, change being a long time coming. Um, I think we've got a lot working in our favour now with the guidelines. Um, you know, with this centre where we can really focus in on some of these issues. I think that COVID actually was good. A good way of bringing this to the fore. People spend a lot of time in their homes where that wasn't such a good experience um, or where that failed to protect people that, you know, became quite obvious and has given some momentum again to thinking about the way, you know, we house people in Australia. Um, and so I'm being optimistic. I think that we could achieve it. I, I don't know, you know, that um, we would achieve everything in, in five years. I think that there's some things that we can achieve um, more uh, quickly, though, um, some of that is starting to build up these partnerships and work closely and generate the evidence that we need to generate. But also it's really um, arming, you know, people um, with, with this information. You know, as Peter said, if people want to live in housing that's healthy and they can work out how they can know that, that's actually a really important um, fast tracking of, of the, a way that we can start to get action in this space. Well, um, that is all the time we've got for questions. I um, 
I maybe got through half of mine. I have so much more that I would love to ask you, um, but a sincere thanks to everyone on the panel for their um, wisdom and generosity, um, sharing their expertise today.